What has happened everybody? James Hancock here. I'm back with a video celebrating the 50th anniversary of one of the great iconic movies of the 1970s, Chinatown, written by Robert Town and directed by Roman Polanski. And as I've frequently stated on this channel many times over, the 70s is my favorite decade of movies, although the era of the late 20s and the early 30s would also be a, a close second. But one of the many reasons why I love the movies of the 70s is that for a very brief shining moment, the movie business put all the resources behind some of the most ruthless, and stylish, and oftentimes cynical movies ever made. Directed by these visionaries, whose achievements make our present day film culture seem a little you know, anemic by comparison. And I'm talking about movies like Carnal Knowledge by the great Mike Nichols, or Straw Dogs by Sam Peckinpah, or McCabe and Mrs. Miller by Robert Altman, or The Conversation by Francis Ford Coppola, The Devils by Ken Russell, Clockwork Orange by Stanley Kubrick, French Connection by William Friedkin, the list just goes on and on and on. And this was an era of giants like Martin Scorsese, or Woody Allen, or Michael Cimino, or Terrence Malick, or Brian De Palma. They were all coming into their own while there were still a a few aging legends from the golden age of Hollywood, from like the 30s and 40s, guys like John Huston, who were uh, basically enjoying like a, a career rebirth with some of the best work of his career as both a director as well as, as an actor, as we'll get to in a moment. But for me, it was a true second golden age for Hollywood. And like any golden age, nothing lasts forever. And whether you want to call this era the film school generation or the new Hollywood or whatever the case might be, it really only lasted from like the late 60s up through about 1974. Basically, it started to all come crashing down with uh, right around the period of Chinatown. Basically, once Robert Evans stopped running Paramount, this little golden age was over and we started seeing cocaine and box office taking over the city and I'm, I'm not saying that they're not great movies from the late 70s The Deer Hunter is one of the great movies of the 1970s Rolling Thunder is one of the great movies of the 1970s but I just prefer the early 70s where things were just darker and more evil and just more diabolical and we had these bleak classic endings and when it comes to grim bleak endings no ending is more nihilistic and depressing and yet still satisfying than the ending to Chinatown but what I find fascinating about Chinatown is how it's this rare exercise in just an old respected genre basically a genre that was popularized by Raymond Chandler but also practiced by people like James M. Cain or uh, Mickey Spillane or Jim Thompson but the reason this movie's become such a beloved classic over the last 50 years, it's like no matter which angle you look at the movie from or like which, which department you want to discuss or which creative contributions you want to analyze, every aspect of this movie was created with total precision, total expertise by one of the best crews ever assembled. Because for director Roman Polanski, this wasn't some great passion project that he'd been thinking about for years. He didn't even want to come back to LA. He had to be talked into coming back to LA to work on this. So basically, this was work for hire where uh, Robert Evans, the, uh, the great producer, aka the great seducer, as Polanski liked to describe him, he basically had to convince Polanski to come back to LA because after the, uh, the murder of Sharon Tate in the late 60s, Polanski never really wanted to come back to Hollywood ever again. But also, this was a chance for him to end his recent cold streak. He'd had a couple movies really underperformed. Macbeth, which I like, had underperformed, and what, with a question mark on the end, which I must admit, I've still never seen. It's on my, uh, on my to-do list. But after those two movies underperformed, Polanski hoped that uh, Chinatown might put him back on top, like he experienced in the late 60s after directing uh, Rosemary's Baby. But even if Polanski didn't consider it some great personal film on his part, it absolutely was a personal film for screenwriter Robert Town, who had been writing and rewriting this movie for years on end with his, um, his kind of secret writing partner, what, uh, Edward Taylor. Edward Taylor is one of the great unsung heroes in the screenwriting business. For, for basically 40 years, he was kind of the clandestine secret writing partner for Robert Town, and only in recent years have we started to realize just how many contributions he made to Robert Town's screenplays. But for Robert Town... This was a love song to an L.A. that no longer existed. Like, Robert Town could remember the L.A. of the 1930s, and basically as the town started to grow like a cancer, it just changed forever. I mean, as, as crazy it might, as it might sound, Hollywood and the movie business in a lot of ways resembled like a small town for many, many decades on end. But by the mid-70s, that was more or less over. But this was an interesting opportunity for screenwriter Robert Town to basically examine and explore one of the darkest chapters in Los Angeles history. Like, really take a close look at just corruption and greed and evil incarnate, all with his own fictionalized version of events and his own fictional characters, but examining real life history. And as they uh, famously say in the other uh, movie, you either have to bring the water to LA or bring LA to the water. It's gonna be a lot of irate citizens when they find out that they're paying for water that they're not gonna get. Oh, that's all taken care of. See, Mr. Gibbs, either you bring the water to LA or you bring LA to the water. 
It is a thriller. It is a, a film noir. It is a hard-boiled detective story about water. And it's funny, when you say it's about water, it makes it sound so innocent. But this is easily the darkest to most sinister, probably, probably the darkest, most sinister film noir ever made with uh, a few other movies like Kiss Me Deadly kind of nibbling at its heels. But after years and years and years of sweating and toiling over the script and doing all this research and all these different drafts, finally there came a day where he sold the screenplay and you had to invite other contributors and collaborators into the process to help flesh out the story. And the end result, I think, is one of the, the best cast and crews ever assembled for any movie. I mean, let's just start with Roman Polanski. With, with Polanski, what you get is somebody who knows every department. He could act. He could operate the camera. He could write screenplays. He obviously could direct. But everybody talks about how um, because he was so aware of all the needs and concerns of all the different departments, it made him like that much more equipped to help those departments contribute their best work possible to the finished product. And I'm talking about uh, contributors like production designer Richard Silbert, a.k.a. Dick Silbert. I mean, he's one of the greatest production designers in movie history, so much so he actually ran Paramount at one point after Robert Evans uh, stepped down and or uh, got fired. But Richard Silbert, he came from the world of Mike Nichols, and he represented taste. He represented integrity. He represented style. He represented entertainment. And he brought a lot to all the movies that he worked on in the 1960s and 1970s. Then you have a director of photography, John Alonzo, who was a last-minute replacement for Stanley Cortez. I mean, Stanley Cortez, legendary DP, but... Also legendary for being kind of slow. Uh, He uh, famously was a little slow on Magnificent Ambersons, which uh, led to a lot of problems on that movie. But he got fired pretty early on, but John Alonzo came on, and basically he and Roman Polanski divided the duties where Polanski told him, look, you light the scenes, I'll compose the shot. And speaking of uh, composing shots, this was the first movie that I saw back in college where I became aware of shot composition. And like shot composition is one of those things where if you're too aware of it, it becomes distracting. But I can vividly recall being in my room my sophomore year in college watching this movie on Laserdisc where I was like, Eureka, I've got it. Like the director arranges things with a sense of purpose and a sense of style and design anyway. For some people that aha moment comes early, some people that comes late. For me it came at age 20 watching Chinatown. But getting back to this astonishing cast and crew, we also have composer Jerry Goldsmith, who was a last-minute hire brought in to replace the score. And what he composed and what was performed for this movie is one of the all-time great scores when it comes to establishing the sense of longing and the sense of yearning and the sense of sadness at the core of the movie. It's just absolutely awe-inspiring. Then you have editors like Sam Osteen. Like editors oftentimes get overshadowed, uh, overshadowed by directors because the directors get to be the big flamboyant character, like wearing like you know boots, like wielding a riding crop and like screaming through a bullhorn and that sort of thing. But every great director has a really good editor working behind them, or the director has to be a really good editor in their own right. But uh, here we have a situation where even like costume designers like Anthea Silbert contribute so much to the movie. Like, has there ever been a better costume in movie history than Jack Nicholson wearing that? Fedora, shades, bandage on the nose, cigarette like kind of hanging off his lip, and all those like, you know, perfectly tailored suits. He looks so fucking good. He looks so goddamn cool. He looks so vain. But I feel like uh, if you if you don't have a great costume designer, you're you're missing out on an incredible opportunity to flesh out the character through their wardrobe. And of course, we've got a uh, producer, Robert Evans, who was at the peak of his power. Robert Evans was right at this, he was at a pivot point in his career where he was still ahead of production at Paramount working for Charlie Blue Dorn, but he had the most enviable deal, or the most, I guess, yeah, enviable? Anyway, he had a deal which made him the envy of the entire city where he could run the studio, but he could also produce one movie per year, which uh, basically put him at war with uh, Frank Yablons over at uh, Paramount as well. But this was Robert Evans before the cocaine really got his hooks into him. And he was just a master of basically identifying talent, putting them all together, and then like keeping all the executives at bay, you know, apart from himself, and allowing the filmmakers to deliver the best work possible. Like he knew you don't hire artists and then constantly tell them how to paint their painting. Like you let them do their thing. Although he did try to make a few creative contributions. Like he famously tried to have the dailies printed with this uh, really red tint to it, which uh, made Polanski go crazy. But it must be said, after Polanski had to leave the film during post-production to go work on some opera, it was actually Robert Evans who supervised the new score. And so it, it's easy to criticize producers for offering too many notes to films, but I feel like Robert Evans' contributions through this movie, bringing in Jerry Goldsmith, it's one of the great last-minute saves by a producer in movie history.
But in the end, no matter how talented and visionary your crew might be, you do need a good cast to bring it all to life. And oh my God, Jack Nicholson, Faye Dunaway, and John Huston, with, with their contributions and what they brought to the table, a masterpiece slowly took shape. And in spite of the many obstacles that could have destroyed the project along the way, and there were many, somehow, just like the stars were aligned and the movie just turned out perfect. And I don't use that word lightly, but if you want the true deep dive on the, uh, the making of this movie. I strongly recommend The Big Goodbye by Sam Wasson. Uh, you can check out the audiobook where he reads it himself, or you can just pick up the, uh, the hardcover. But Sam Wasson right now, I think he's the best writer out there on film history. He had his recent book, uh, The Path to Paradise, about Francis Ford Coppola. And the good news is he still has a few more books that I've not yet read. And he's actually not that old. I think he's like late 30s or early 40s. But He's incredible, but he writes film history the way a great novelist would bring like, you know, a, a, their fictional creation to life. Perhaps he's embellishing a bit, or perhaps he's adding a, additional pathos or drama or emotion, but there's, there's no denying his absolute love and reverence for these giants. And he really helps articulate just how, in 1974, this incredible rush of creativity that had reinvented the industry and made Hollywood for the first time in decades feel young and open to new possibilities. Really, Chinatown was the beginning of the end, sadly. And so as much as I might love the early 70s, yeah, the, the, the real juicy part of the 70s did not last that long. But the danger in reading a book as strong as this one is that when you're doing a video celebrating the, uh, the movie after on its 50th anniversary, the, uh, the risk is that I will just basically copy and or steal or just rip off all of the, uh, the, all the points that Sam Watson made in his book. So I'm going to try to, to the best of my ability, make this video like my own thoughts, my own analysis, my own feelings about the film. But I'm standing in the shadow of greatness. So yeah, The Big Goodbye, Chinatown in the Last Years of Hollywood gets my highest possible recommendation. If, if only for the brilliant way that it captures the creative intelligence, the taste, and just the astonishing technical, technical expertise of this incredible crew. Because while we might enjoy a shot or a scene as it's unfolding, once you hear a little bit about like the behind the scenes about how they achieve these shots on a relatively small budget, I mean, these, this movie was made for what, like somewhere between like three and six million. I've, se I've seen somewhere, some people say six million. I've seen some people say three million. But just little things like the final shot of the movie where it's interrupted by one jump cut. But it's one of the most famous handheld shots in movie history. And yet, in spite of being a handheld shot with all that gritty authenticity, suddenly the movie transitions into this beautiful crane shot. We're like, wait a second, are we watching Casablanca? Like, how did they make that transition? And in this book... You will, uh, you will read all about, like how John Alonzo and Ron Polanski got together and figured out how to make that transition from you know really gritty, raw, and authentic handheld shot to this very graceful, elegant crane shot rising up, looking over Chinatown. But one of the craziest things about Chinatown is that somehow, in spite of so many different obstacles working against it, and how so many people within the industry were rooting against it, and how everybody kind of thought that uh, Robert Evans was flying a little too close to the sun, but somehow, in spite of all these obstacles, the movie became a hit. I mean, conventional wisdom is, you know, slap a happy ending on it and your box office will go up. But this movie was beloved by critics. I think it got nominated for either 10 or 11 Academy Awards. It only won one for screenplay, but it was going up against Godfather Part Two. That was a very uh, competitive year for the Oscars. I mean, if you look at the, the Oscar ceremony from 1975, celebrating the movies from 1974, you're like, oh my God, in the 50 years since then, while there might be more entertainment than ever before, like a great art form truly has been lost. And that has uh, nothing makes you more aware of how much the industry has changed. And when you go back and see just how competitive it was 50 years ago when it came to the best movies competing for all the various Oscars. But the reason I say it's unusual for this movie to become such a beloved hit is that the ending is like the closest we've ever come to like a true black hole of just despair and corruption. Like basically, as Robert Towns set out to do, he wanted to depict a world or create a world where all good intentions are ultimately futile. Like there's, not that, the, there's nothing more futile than trying to do the right thing, which is why you get all these great scenes about doing as little as possible in Chinatown, because this is a world where the best of your intentions will always be turned against you, where you never quite know what people are telling you, like whether it's true or false, and whether or not they're manipulating you to another end. And in the end, this is just a world where evil prevails. I mean, is there anything more horrifying in 70s cinema than watching John Huston meet his daughter slash granddaughter, spoiler alert, if you have not seen the movie, like bail out on this video now and trying to, in his own halting way, explain to her, I, I, I'm your grandfather. Like you can tell he's never even thought about like, what are you going to say if you ever actually 
meet this individual. But then, after uh, Faye Dunaway has been murdered by the police, watching John Houston wrap his granddaughter in his arms and drag her away, where one can only presume he's going to repeat the same cycle that he went through with his daughter. And it's just like you can only imagine what horrors Faye Dunaway went through in, in the years with her father. Like, I think one of the most telling moments in the entire movie when she's lying in bed with Jack Nicholson and he mentions how he saw her father that morning and the way she's like, my, my, my father, and like the way she kind of like brushes her hair out of her, like some people think it's too much of an affectation the way Faye Dunaway kind of uh, has that hesitation and the way she delivers so many lines of dialogue. But for me, you can just tell decades of abuse has left, have left her just an absolutely shattered individual in a lot of ways. But getting back to this idea of the futility of good intentions and evil prevailing, what's astonishing is how the the, uh, the climax of this movie feels completely inevitable. It feels so satisfying. And in a lot of ways, like filmmakers are kind of guiding you to a destination, but they also have to be open to letting the story guide them. And uh, Robert Town and uh, Roman Polanski, they fought about this ending quite a bit. They rewrote the ending quite a bit. In the end, Robert Town had to surrender creative control in order to sell the screenplay to Paramount and get the movie up and running. So in the end, it was Roman Polanski's call. And early on, Robert Town really hated uh, a lot of the changes that were made to the movie. But when he finally saw the movie with uh, Jerry Goldsmith's score, it all started to come together to, for him, and he started to really fall in love with it. But there were some earlier screenings where Robert Town felt like he uh, might have to disown this movie, where he truly hated it. But it, if you want to make a, um, like a case study out of what is the art of collaboration and the push and pull of people who are fighting like dogs for weeks on end, trying to just hammer a screenplay into shape, Chinatown is uh, the absolute best case study I can think of. But as I was re-watching this Blu-ray the other day, and I strongly recommend everybody add it to, the, to their collection because it has so many great behind-the-scenes featurettes like interviewing directors like Steven Soderbergh about their admiration for the movie or uh, cinematographers like Roger Deakins just talking about the technique. I mean, when you're hearing Roger Deakins describe like how a scene works and why it works for him, like it really just helps you get deeper insights than just into the art of photography. But when you think about this movie that's both modern as well as classically beautiful and 50 years later it still feels modern but also 50 years later it still feels like an homage to uh to classic hollywood but the fact that this complex really disturbing cynical nightmare of a movie uh came to comes together in such satisfying fashion i feel like in a lot of ways in 1974 like the art of cinema had kind of reached its zenith there was the like at this point in the world or at this point in history cinema truly was the ultimate form of artistic expression. And I feel like cinema has fallen from those heights, but what was great is how in 1974, cinema was an art form where all the other art forms in the world, whether you're talking about music or writing or dramatic arts or uh, production design, art direction, they all came together so harmoniously underneath this giant umbrella of cinema. But this is one of those movies where everything comes together in such hauntingly beautiful fashion. If you need a movie that would allow you to kind of say goodbye to movies, like this actually might be the movie where you realize, all right, cinema had basically like a hundred years of greatness where they got to you know, rule the planet. And now we have all these other competing forms of media that almost seem to be in the process of like erasing all culture that has come before. But if you have a, uh, a love affair with movies, whether it lasts for a couple years or for your entire life, if you ever just need to have a moment where you say, all right, it's time to just let go of movies and just recognize that something isn't beautiful because it lasts forever, I feel like Chinatown is uh, is one of those movies. But I've been ranting and raving quite a bit at this point without offering any critiques of the movie whatsoever. And I feel like when people say that this movie is perfect, it's kind of a useless thing to say. Like, what does it mean to say a movie is perfect? Like, is a movie better or worse because it is perfect? Like, there are plenty of great flawed masterpieces out there where the flaws almost kind of enhance the movie in some ways. So uh, let's offer one major critique, which I no longer feel, but I did feel at age 20 when I first saw it. The pacing is a little off the uh, the first, well, at least it was off for me the first time I saw it, where just the plot was so mysterious and so abstract and kind of so impenetrable, I almost found the movie to be indecipherable in certain ways, where I, like, I felt like the movie was beautiful and it was so satisfying watching Jack Nicholson just like basically on steroids being like the ultimate version of the cynical, sneering, just like, you know, get, get, get the fuck out of my face version of Jack that I'd ever seen. But like if somebody had put a gun to my head and say, explain the plot of Chinatown, I'd be like, uh, uh, it's about water and uh, incest. And uh, I don't, I mean, I guess that's a great way to describe the plot. It's a movie about water. It's a movie about incest, but it's ultimately a movie about 
corruption. But this might come as a shock to some of you out there, but not every idea or impulse or feeling that you experience at age 20 is necessarily fueled with wisdom or insight. And what I didn't understand at the time is that this movie spoon feeds you nothing. If you want information, you're gonna have to earn it. And there's no hand holding, they don't guide you by the nose. Like the secrets and revelations that are so horrifying at the core of the story, you have to, like Jake Giddies, or Mr. Gitz, Jake Giddies has to earn these revelations and because this movie is shot in such a subjective way, we have to earn those revelations and secrets right alongside him. This movie is one of the great exercises in showing a movie from a central character's point of view where pretty much every single scene starts with him entering the room and every scene ends with him leaving the room. And it makes it so incredibly satisfying as like as you become more familiar with the mystery and all the details and all the horrors that happened in the past with like dams collapsing and like hundreds of people dying. And when you see just how a handful of people got really rich just fucking with the water supply for Los Angeles County. But in so many ways, we almost feel like the central character for this movie because the camera, in spite of having those giant fucking lenses on the end of it, the camera is always kind of ominously floating right over Jake's shoulder where we're just, we are experiencing the movie the way he experiences the movie. And it's just so goddamn satisfying. And I, I hate saying this because it's such a cliche, but this truly is one of those movies where each time you watch it, you're like, oh my God. I thought I liked this movie and I thought I understood this movie, but it's so much better than I, than I initially thought. And it's you know so much more interesting than I originally thought. And until you've seen this movie somewhere between like five and 10 times, like with coffee in hand, I almost feel like uh, you shouldn't even discuss the movie with anybody because the people who love this movie all acknowledge that it, it takes a couple times before you really start to kind of fully unlock the mysteries. Although who knows, maybe there's some people out there where they saw it for the first time in 1974, like, oh, this is a goddamn masterpiece. Maybe they got it on first viewing, but at age 20, yeah, I just, uh, I wasn't totally, uh, totally on its wavelength yet. And speaking of which, one thing I can't stand is when I see like articles and or videos titled like why Chinatown no longer works for the modern generation or why Chinatown no longer works for people under a certain age. And what I find most irritating, like if someone doesn't like Chinatown, fair play, no one's required to like Chinatown. But when somebody presumes to speak on behalf of an entire generation of people, almost as if like somehow like we need to be concerned or worried that somebody who has anointed themselves the spokesperson of an entire generation, they don't like it. Therefore, like we need to question our own assumptions or what we like and don't like. And what these fucking morons never take into account is that I can remember vividly in the 1990s when I was in college when I would have to encounter people on a routine basis who would say, I hate French Connection. French Connection is boring. Or I hate Chinatown. Chinatown's boring. Like they, these people seem to think that in previous generations, everybody was always on the same page and that there weren't people actually like having debates and arguments about which movies are great and which movies weren't like everybody needs to learn to think for themselves and in order to make your point if you do if you do truly despise and hate this movie you don't need to rally your entire generation to make this point because i imagine that there are just as many people who are in their 20s now who hate this movie as those who love this movie if you want to criticize it just criticize it from its own point of view you don't need an army to back you up but I've been raining quite a bit at this point, and I feel like I almost still haven't even gotten started. I know that sounds totally ridiculous. I've, I almost feel like when you're discussing a movie, you should never discuss the movie for a greater length of time than the actual running time of the movie. Like If the movie can make all of its points in two hours, you should be able to make your points about the movie in like 30 minutes or less. The only exception would be when you're writing a great book like The Big Goodbye. I think if you listen to the audiobook, it's about 10 hours in length, but I feel like uh, Sam Watson, he gets a pass for spending more time discussing it than Roman Polanski did, you know, telling the story on the screen. But let me try to get more, a little more tight and economical and focused because I feel like I haven't given enough credit to the screenplay yet. And, you know, there are a lot of people out there who would say it's the greatest screenplay ever written, whatever the fuck that even means. It obviously is a masterpiece in screenwriting. And, and I, I guess what makes it so interesting is how it's a great screenplay not based on a book. It's a great screenplay that is based on research and building characters from scratch. And one of these days I am gonna do a video of my top 10 favorite original screenplays that were invented purely for the cinema. But if you wanna say it's one of the great screenplays, yeah, I have no problem with that. And it's funny when you read about how uh, Robert Town and Roman Polanski were just fighting, 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 fighting for weeks on end. Roman Polanski will concede or he will acknowledge no matter how much he disagreed with Robert Town about the structure, and which side character should be included or how it should end, he says that Robert Town's ear for dialogue is second to none. And a great screenplay has got to be got to be about more than just great sounding dialogue or great lines. But 
if your idea of a great screenplay is just Jack, Jack Nicholson talking shit to people, well, this movie is the mother load because Robert Town, he knew Jack Nicholson. He had been his roommate at one point. They'd taken acting classes together, and no one knew how to play to his strengths as an actor better than screenwriter Robert Town. The coroner's report proves that he had salt water in his lungs when he was killed. Just take my word for it, all right? Now, I want to know how it happened, and I want to know why, and I want to know before Escobar gets here, because I don't want to lose my license. But as you watch this movie and rewatch it and rewatch it again, you become aware of the fact that what makes this screenplay so great is not just the snappy dialogue, but it's the structure and the way the information is slowly unveiled and how you almost have to kind of like read between the lines or look over the shoulders of the characters, like pay close attention to what people are talking about in the background as you start to learn about the troubled history of where the water goes in this town and who will have access to it, who will own the water supply, or more importantly, who will own the land where that water is being redirected and will that land be incorporated into Los Angeles County. I mean, we're talking about corruption on a grand scale where uh, – quite a bit of money is being made, or money enough to buy the future, as uh, Noah Cross likes to say. I mean, one of the best scenes of all is when Jack Nicholson's saying, like, like, how much are you worth? Like, how much better can you eat? Like, what else, what else can you buy? And John Huston says, the future, Mr. Gitz. Why are you doing it? How much better can you eat? What can you buy that you can't already afford? The future, Mr. Gitz. The future. And I love how he calls him Mr. Gitz the whole movie. Apparently, the first time he called him Mr. Gitz was a mistake, but they loved the way he pronounced it that they decided to uh, keep it in the movie and, and reuse that pronunciation over and over and over again. But even more interesting about how the information is slowly revealed to the audience is how because we're seeing this whole movie through Jake Giddy's point of view, oftentimes that information is misleading or we think what we know is going on, and he and we turn out to be completely wrong and he's told over and over and over again about how like you might think you know what's going on but you don't you may think you know what you're dealing with but believe me you don't why is that funny it's what the district attorney used to tell me in chinatown he also explains to other characters about how his horrible as his horrible experiences in chinatown back in the day how he had been told, like, do as little as possible. Whatever you think you're being told, whatever you think you might be doing, is probably being twisted or turned to a, a, a more horrible outcome. And even though we have this warning again and again and again, both Jake and the audience, we think, we think he's on the side of the righteous. We think he's doing the right thing. And as we show once again, this movie is all about the futility of good intentions. And if like, what, like that old cliche, people talk about how uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And I feel like we're living in an era where people are like wrapping themselves in the blanket of their good intentions, like to a point where it just makes you want to fucking vomit when you see just how self-righteous people can be. I'm being self-righteous, even as I accuse people of being self-righteous. But I feel like Everybody needs to sit down and watch Chinatown and realize, oh, you know what? Even if you think you're doing the right thing, sometimes you are bringing evil into this world. And yeah, the, like every single scene in this movie, it's always hinting at deeper levels of corruption, deeper levels of rot. Like the the entire like bedrock of Los Angeles County is just like this cancer that's slowly rising to the surface, and we're starting to see little tumors sprouting in the desert. And speaking of the desert, this is what you get when you have an incredible production designer and an incredible costume designer working in tandem where the burnt out husk of the desert and all these dry riverbeds because of water being misdirected to other areas, that aesthetic or that color palette is reflected like in so many other spots in the movie. Just like the opening credits, like, wait a second, is the whole movie just going to be brown the entire time? And the answer is yes, more or less, apart from my Jack Nicholson's, like, you know, perfectly tailored pajamas, but this is a very brown, dried up desert movie. Like his, uh, his suits oftentimes reflect that color palette. The, the look of the interior of people's offices reflects that color palette. And it's one of the things where it shouldn't call attention to itself overtly because at that point you're doing a b bad job as a filmmaker. But it's one of the things that you start to notice as you revisit the, the movie over and over and over again about how every aspect of this movie is part of the desert and part of the rot at the core of this movie. But I also love how the screenplay, it hints at all these tragedies in the past without ever fully like fleshing them out or articulating them. Like You get this sense that Jake Geddes really is a, a shattered person. In spite of his confidence, in spite of how slick he looks, in spite of how just like, what a fucking badass he is in every single scene. 
but you get the sense that like he's a shell of a human being who's never recovered from this girl where he was trying to play a role in helping a girl from like prevent her from getting hurt and ultimately ended up playing a, a role directly in leading to her getting hurt. And not only is, is he haunted by this experience in the past in Chinatown, this is a cycle that he is doomed to, re to repeat. And that's another part about this movie with the futility of good intentions, how people will make the same mistakes over and over again, hoping for a different result. But it's just a cycle of doom that we are all trapped in. Like Chinatown is a mood. It is a state of mind. Like in earlier drafts of the movie, there weren't even any scenes in Chinatown. And so much so people like Robert Evans are like, why is the movie called Chinatown? If like, if they never go to Chinatown and slow to but surely Roman Polanski added some actual scenes in Chinatown. But like the idea of a horrible experience in Chinatown reflecting this overall mood and vibe of the movie. It's so mysterious and so, it's almost impossible to articulate, but that's what makes the movie have such an, an incredible sense of atmosphere that's so fascinating and so inviting. Forget it, Jake, it's Chinatown. But in the end, like, what does the title Chinatown stand for? What it stands for is that look on Jack Nicholson's face as he's looking down at Evelyn Mulray and seeing that once again, a woman has been hurt or killed as a result of him trying to protect her and just seeing how he is, he's destroyed. He, I mean, the, this cycle of doom has repeated itself again. And watching um, Escobar saying like, you know, uh, you want to be a good friend? Like, you know, get him the hell out of here. I mean... That scene is just a master class in filming. It's one of the best one of the best scenes in any movie from any era where the devastation and the shattered emotions of the central character, we are experiencing them as well, and we just can't fucking believe what we have seen. And the only thing that kind of lets a little bit of the uh, kind of the pressure off or lets takes that elephant's foot off of our chest is when uh, Jake's uh, co-worker says, forget it, Jake, it's Chinatown. And you're like, okay, yeah, f like this is horrible. This is just the most cynical, evil, diabolical shit that I've ever seen, but we just gotta put it behind us. It's like, forget it, Jake, it's Chinatown. And that's when the camera begins to rise, and you're like, wow, it was tragic, it was sad, it was horrible, but it was strangely beautiful and irresistible. So maybe I've said enough about Robert Town at this point, but I'll just say that Robert Town, he's one of the few celebrity screenwriters in movie history. Like There are a lot of uh, great directors, there are a lot of great stars that people like to call attention to, but Robert Town, like, he'd been doing like um, uncredited rewrites of movies like The Godfather, or maybe people probably have heard of. But this, this period is right when he was going to enter like his greatest hot streak, where he would adapt the book for the last detail, and he would also write Shampoo for uh, director Hal Ashby, which is also one of my favorite movies of the 1970s. Like Everybody thinks about Shampoo. It's like, oh, it's nothing but silly hairstyles and people having sex and listening to music. That is yet another movie filled with incredible melancholy for a lost Los Angeles. And only somebody who is from Los Angeles, who loves the history of Los Angeles, can really give you that feeling of longing for the small town days before, once again, like, like, like it spread like a cancer over all of Southern California. But I keep saying I'm going to stop talking about the screenplay. Let's try and talk about something else. Uh, let's talk about Faye Dunaway, Jack Nicholson, and John Huston, just an astonishing cast. But with Jack feel like uh, one of the ways this movie plays to his strength is allowing him like those bursts of rage. Like no one can like have like a, like throw a shit fit better than Jack Nicholson. Like he's in the barber shop. Somebody starts talking shit about his profession. He immediately is ready to scrap, ready to go. And I just love how he always thinks he's in control. He always thinks he knows what's going on. He always thinks he can see all the angles and he doesn't realize that he's way in over his head. Hold it, uh, kitty cat. Hold it. Hello, Claude. Where'd you get the midget? But they do it in a way where they never make him seem like a buffoon or foolish. He is a very cunning private investigator. He just happens to be going up against like the true heart of darkness lurking at the core of Los Angeles County, a.k.a. Noah Cross. And speaking of those bursts of outrage, some of those bursts of outrage were reflected in real life as well. I mean, one of the most famous behind-the-scenes outbursts by both Jack as well as Roman Polanski was when Polanski was taking a long time getting a, a shot set up of like some Venetian blinds, and Jack was getting frustrated because the Lakers were, were playing, and uh, they were going into overtime and double overtime, and Jack was so frustrated that like he had been so patient earlier, he wasn't about to leave during double overtime. And apparently Polanski like burst into his trailer wielding a mop, like hell bent upon destroying the TV, but because of 
of like the small confines of the trailer, you couldn't really swing them up. But he'd be like threw the TV out the window, and then he and Jack started screaming at each other. And they quite literally, Jack just out of rage started ripping off his own clothes, and then Roman Polanski started ripping off his own clothes, and then they both drove off. And according to the legend, you know, you can believe what you want to believe, but apparently once they got off the set. They were both at the same stoplight, and they looked over at each other, and they just started snickering. Because they were both like in behind the wheel of their cars in their underwear. They got out, hugged each other, and said, you know what? Let's not tell anybody on the crew that we've like had a reconciliation. Let's just let them th like, think the worst, and then they'll get a big happy surprise tomorrow. But it's just you know, two maniacs at the height of their creative energy just uh, letting off a little steam. But speaking of letting off a little steam, Faye Dunaway let off a little steam as well. And Jack had to aggressively campaign for Faye Dunaway. Like it's easy to look back at Faye Dunaway now as like the great iconic actress of the 1970s. She is my favorite actress of, from the 1970s because of this movie, but more importantly because of Network, which would come shortly thereafter. But she was considered uh, difficult. And she'd had a couple of, it had been a while since Bonnie and Clyde. Like Bonnie and Clyde had been an iconic movie that helped usher in the new Hollywood. But that was like, what, 1967, 1968? And she had been struggling to land a role in a movie as big as Bonnie and Clyde. And even though everybody thought she was incredibly beautiful and incredibly talented, there, there were a lot of problems on this movie. So much so, at one point, she was actively campaigning for Roman Polanski to be fired. And like, like if he, either he goes or I go. And uh, Robert Evans basically told her and her agent, Roman Polanski, said, look, nobody's leaving. I'm going to have my great actress. I'm going to have my great director. And we're all going to learn to get along but uh, the most famous um, kind of uh, confrontation between Polanski and Faye Dunaway, apparently they, there was a hair sticking up, and he kept bringing in um, people to like kind of flatten it. Like it, it was showing up in the lighting, and no matter how much like the hair sprayed or combed it, it just kept popping up. And at one point, Polanski just leaned over, grabbed that hair, and bing, plucked it out. And let's just say Faye Dunaway lost her goddamn mind. And you know when you see her outburst in the movies, you can only imagine as an actress what that outburst must have resembled, and I've heard at one point that um, she even threw a cup of pee in his face. I don't know if that's true or not. Like, when, when you're talking about history from 50 years ago, when people have so much like love and affection for all these uh, individuals involved, you know, film freaks love to embellish the history, and so it gets very difficult to tell the fact from the fiction. Nonetheless, she and uh, Polanski did fight like cats and dogs to the point where they just had to stop speaking to each other except through intermediaries, which was easy for Polanski because he never really mastered English. And so when he finally realized John Alonzo, his DP, spoke Italian. So Polanski and John Alonzo would speak in Italian, and then John Alonzo would give his instructions to the, uh, to the rest of the crew, which worked out just fine. But as much as I love Jack Nicholson in this movie and as much as I love Faye Dunaway in this movie, what I really love is seeing one of my all-time favorite filmmakers turning into one of the great character actors. So John Huston. Of course I'm respectable. I'm old. Politicians, ugly buildings, and whores all get respectable if they last long enough. Uh, for people out there who might be a little younger and are not aware of the, uh, the history of John Huston, he basically is the most talented member of a true filmmaking dynasty. Like his father, Walter Huston, incredible actor. If you want to see what I'm talking about, watch uh, Treasure of the Sierra Madre, where he's directed by his son to an Oscar. And obviously, um, uh, Angelica Huston, she's done a ton of incredible movies. And now we're seeing, uh, you know, basically many more members of the Huston family, like Danny Huston, continuing to carry on the family name. But it's John Huston who is the real the real legend of that family, where as a screenwriter in the late 30s, he was off to a good start, but when he directed Maltese Falcon, it was the beginning of uh, one of the great careers. I mean, if you want to talk about Hall of Fame, kind of uh, Mount Rushmore filmmakers, uh, John Huston's one of those names who periodically will pop up on my Mount Rushmore, because from Maltese Falcon up through the dead in the late 80s, he's one of those rare directors where he made good movies for like 45 years. Like A lot of directors will have a hot streak for you know two or three movies in one decade, how many directors can you name where they make good movies across many, many, like basically a half century? Like Luis Buñuel is one of those directors. Ingmar Bergman's one of those directors. But there are not a lot of them who can continue to do great work. And I would argue that as good as Houston was in the 40s with movies like Treasure of the Sierra Madre and Maltese Falcon, his best decade as a director is the 1970s, where he made Fat City, where he made The Man Who Would Be King. Like These are some of my all-time favorite movies. And yet, he took a break from directing to handle some of his gambling debts 
by acting in this movie. I mean, maybe his time would have been better spent if he'd made another movie like The Life and Times of Judge Roy Bean, one of his best movies, but I love the fact that he acted in this movie because he brings something to the table that the character of Noah Cross needs. We can tell John Huston's one of those guys where he's used to getting his way. He's been getting his way for a long time, and they say like when he would come onto the set, it was almost like impossible to work because he would sit down, usually half drunk on vodka, and start telling stories, and everybody would stop working just to listen to him tell stories. And he just he exuded that kind of power and influence. Obviously, as a filmmaker, it's very different. But like he'd been master of the hounds for some uh, for some fox hunt in Ireland for a while, and he's used to traveling around the world as a a big game hunter. Oftentimes, he would choose his locations where he would film movies like The African Queen, just because he liked to uh, be able to go elephant hunting in the evening. I mean, he's like one of those great Titanic, legendary, larger than life figures, and we will not see their like again in the movie industry, where they seemed like a globe-trotting adventurer more so than a filmmaker. And he just brought all that to the table with the character of Noah Cross, like, you know, like when he's talking about how he prefers to like eat fish with the head on and that sort of thing. And just watching that chemistry with him and Jack, Jack Nicholson was also a writer and producer and director and an actor, much like how uh, John Huston was. And they just had this incredible rapport, like so much so that Jack Nicholson, who at that time had just started dating John Huston's daughter, Angelica Huston, adding additional venom to the scenes where Noah Cross asked, like, are you sleeping with my daughter? But he and Jack Nicholson got so close that Jack Nicholson at one point said that when uh, John Huston dies, I will cry for the rest of my life, which basically sums it all up. Like from the moment they met, Apparently they were sitting on opposite sides of a table, lighting each other's cigars, making each other laugh, telling each other stories, and you can just feel that coming off the, the screen in waves. But as I mentioned before, The Big Goodbye unfolds much like a great novel, and my favorite scene in this book has to be the uh, the introduction of John Huston because the whole cast and crew, they're on this orange grove shooting this complex scene, and they see a lone rider in a distance approaching, and it's a rider dressed all in white, and he keeps tipping his hat to people and talking to people in Spanish, and everybody's like, who is that guy? And as he gets closer, they realize, oh my God, this is John Huston. John Huston knew how to ride very, very well, and he taught his kids how to ride very, very well, but the way he just kind of strode onto the set, like he owned everything that he surveyed, they realized, oh yeah, like Noah Cross has been, uh, has been very well cast. But the way Sam Watson describes him, it's almost like this mythic figure from the Wild West, or from like the, you know, the pioneer days of making movies in Hollywood. And it just, it's captured so perfectly. So yeah, thank you, Sam Watson, for uh, perfectly uh, bringing the character of, uh, of John Huston to life in such loving detail. But this movie could have very easily flown off the rails in spite of having all this incredible cast and crew. If you did not have one of the world's greatest directors bring it all together. I feel like that's kind of the job of the director is to be a little, little bit of a lion tamer where you need to marshal and harness all the creative energy of an incredible cast and crew and make sure they're all more or less marching in the same direction, trying to make the same movie, even if they don't even know they're making the same movie, but like, how do you get the best work out of them where the work will work together harmoniously instead of clashing? And at this time, you can make a case for Roman Polanski as one of the best directors in the world. I mean, in the 1960s, with this movie's uh, Knife in the Water, uh, Repulsion, which is a personal favorite of mine. If you want to see a killer thriller, killer thriller, that's a great expression, from the 1960s, oh my God, like uh, Repulsion will absolutely blow your goddamn mind. But Rosemary's Baby made him a goddamn superstar. He was one of those rare directors where he was a great artist but he could also give you a hit. And I'm not saying he would like, give you a hit every single time, as we learned with uh, Macbeth and with what? With a uh, question mark on the end. But he at least had the capacity to, uh, to give you a, a hit in addition to an artistic masterpiece. And he would continue to do good work for many, many years. I mean, The Tenant is an awe-inspiring movie. Bitter Moon is one of my favorite erotic thrillers that I've ever seen. One of my favorite movies I've ever seen, period. His personal favorite of his movies is The Pianist from, I think, 2002. But he will concede, even though this was work for hire, like in an interview with Polanski on the Blu-ray, he talks about how Chinatown is his second favorite movie behind The, uh, behind the Pianist. And it reminds me a little bit of uh, Orson Welles when he made Touch of Evil, where Touch of Evil wasn't necessarily some great passion project for him either. He had been hired to play the heavy, and then Charlton Heston recommended to the producers, well, you know, Orson's actually a really good director. Like, what if you allow him to turn this novel badge of evil into touch of evil and, you know, really, really have at it? And I feel like sometimes a director will give you their best work just with a, uh, a film that is a work-for-hire project where they're just showing up, trying to pay the bills, trying to get back on, um, trying to basically get back in the black as opposed to putting together a string of flops. And I guess there's something really cool about, like, the film noir, hardball detective stories, 
they're not that expensive to make. Basically, you need your stars and you need your superstar cast and crew, but you don't need a bunch of special effects. Like the period might be expensive to create, but you can always do a present day hard boiled detective story. But I feel like anytime a, a filmmaker is in trouble, a good film noir or a good horror movie is a great way to get back in a uh, strong commercial footing so that your career can continue because you don't get to see the tenant if you don't have Chinatown coming beforehand. But I'm looking at my notes in despair because I got so excited while I was rewatching this and I got so excited while listening to the audiobook. I just, I, I took too many goddamn notes and this video is going to end up being longer than the movie itself. So now I'm just going to start throwing out certain things that I feel like have to be called attention to, even if I, I don't have time to go as much into detail as I would like. But uh, we have to talk about the poster by Jim Pearsall. I hope I'm saying his name correctly, but I've said it before and I'll say it again. The art of movie poster design, which is being very much uh, lovingly maintained by a few artists out there like uh, Tony Stella, but it is more often than not being neglected by the great majority of movies coming out these days where they're just looked upon as promotional materials or marketing materials. And obviously you need marketing materials to market and promote your movie, but what's wrong with letting your movie posters be a great work of art in their own right where they hint at the beauty and the majesty and the kind of like the haunting corruption at the core of the movie. And yeah, this, this poster, it's one of the great posters that's uh, ever been designed by anybody in any era in any country. It's just absolutely fucking gorgeous. But also I just want to acknowledge the humor of this movie. As dark and pessimistic as it might be, periodically I just find myself bursting out laughing. Like the first time we see Jack Nicholson after his uh, nose has been slashed by Roman Polanski. You know what happens to nosy fellows? Huh? No? Wanna guess? Huh? No? Okay. They lose their noses. And that scene is absolutely incredible where the fear on Jack's face is absolutely real because the knife they designed, it had a little swivel on the end, but if it was flipped the wrong way, it actually would slash his nose open. And so as Polanski is doing his thing and acting all psycho, you can see Jack's getting really still. But the next time we see him, and there's this bandage covering like three quarters of his face, and he's look and there's something about he just looks so pissed and like he's in so much pain. And he calls attention to it many times over. Like at one point, someone asks, like, does that hurt? And it's like, only when I breathe. And only Jack knows how to deliver lines like that. Or when he's telling Faye Dunaway, you know, this is my nose. I, I, I like breathing through it, blah, blah, blah. I can't remember the exact line, but <coughs> I just think it's uh, hilarious that like half the movie, he has this giant bandage. And the bandage slowly but surely dwindles down to where it's just the stitches but yeah usually in um you got a filmmaking 101 by like you know in the, like the hollywood rule book you would not cover up the face of your star for half the movie but totally works for the uh, for the flick but just as a way of starting to wrap this video up i guess uh in the final analysis this movie does feel like the um a great final chapter in a period of Hollywood from the late 60s and early 70s, a period that will never come again, especially on the Paramount lot. When you look at the, uh, the Oscar ceremony in 1975, how Paramount just dominated. No studio has ever dominated one year of Oscars the same way Paramount did in the, uh, the spring of 75, talking about the year of 1974. But it's just uh, an era where it felt like almost like a small little club of collaborators who were all partying together and having sex together and making all these incredible movies. And that obviously that crew or that inner circle included people like Warren Beatty and Dick Silbert and Mike Nichols or Hal Ashby or Robert Evans, like all these people. And for film fans who love this period, it's very easy to get um, very nostalgic and sentimental. And obviously, if you were there in the early 70s where so much of the movie industry seemed to be in a state of transition or inflamed as it was being reinvented, I'm sure there's some people who thought, like, how come all these movies are about a bunch of, like, you know, anti-heroes? And how come every movie is so pessimistic? And how come every movie seems to be trying to, like, undermine and destroy society? Like, when you see movies like... Bring me the head of Alfredo Garcia. I'm sure there are some people like these movies are, you know, detestable. Like, why are we switching gears into such uh, bleak fare? Which is once again why this movie feels like the final chapter because right right around the time of Jaws and Rocky and Star Wars, the industry started to change where the box office started to get insane and people wanted to feel good again. They were ready to put the Vietnam War and Watergate and just like that early 70s pessimism behind them. And people were ready to feel good and have fun. It's why a movie like American Graffiti 
was such a runaway success. Like George Lucas was not, not making bleak, pessimistic, early 70s movies. He was making a nostalgic movie about the 1950s, and it was a, one of the most profitable movies ever made. And the culture of Hollywood didn't change overnight. I mean, once again, movies like The Deer Hunter continued to get made, but more and more like big commercial escapist entertainment started to take over the culture, which leads to the 1980s, which still has its like subversive works of art and things like Blue Velvet and so on and so forth. But obviously the culture of the 1980s is totally different from the culture of the, of the especially the early 1970s where taste and art and entertainment value all came together so harmoniously, whereas in the 1980s, it was like Ferraris and cocaine. It was the era of Jerry Bruckheimer and Don Simpson. Like Nothing uh, shows the changing of the guard more at Paramount, where producers like Robert Evans were starting to go bye-bye, and producers like Don Simpson were rising to the top. And, you know, in no era ever comes again. Every era has masterpieces that are unique to that era. Every era has uh, movies that are terrible that are unique to that era. I do feel like though in the 2020s, we're living in a particularly bad era. And as, as, of course, it's always easy to say, oh, like, movies suck, like movies are worse than ever. But between shutting down Hollywood for basically two years for the pandemic and then shutting things down last year with the strike, I just feel like the first half of the 20 of the 2020s, we've kind of just like, it's almost been like a wash where we've kind of like have missed that period. And last year, I did have a shitload of movies that I really enjoyed. But I, um, I sympathize with people when they say that like, they're less interested in contemporary movies than ever, and they're more interested in classic movies than ever before, because when you go back and watch movies in the early 70s, yeah, it's very easy to, uh, to go down that rabbit hole and not come up for air for many, many days on end. I said I want the truth! Oh. Ah. <laughs> Need my sister and my daughter! <laughs> so on that very bleak kind of sad, kind of sentimental note, which is very appropriate for the movie that I just discussed. It's time to wrap this video up. Thank you so much for sticking with me as I took this little sentimental journey through uh, one of the best movies of the 1970s. And if you've never seen it, well, then you're in for a treat. And if you've seen it and you weren't initially so hot on it, just like I said, drink a cup of coffee, sit up, watch it again, and just start to appreciate and savor all the little details, and I think uh, if you give it a shot, there's a chance that uh, it might end up becoming one of your all-time favorite movies. But I thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking the video, subscribing to the channel, hit that notification bell, and hit all, otherwise you won't get the, uh, the notifications. But thanks again, but more importantly, as always, onwards and upwards.